Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, spirited conversations with interesting and hilarious people in glasses. I am your host, Christopher Hart. So, a uh, couple things right off the bat. Sazerac and Buffalo Trace have announced this year's Buffalo Trace Antique Collection with one very important part. What's the word? Ellipsed, eclipsed, omitted, omitted. And that is the number of bottles per release. Now, for years, whether it's Eagle Rare, Thomas H. Handy, George T. Stagg, blah, 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 what, whichever one it was, they always released the exact number of bottles for each batch, which would have a heavy influence in its secondary value. A unfortunate side effect of being transparent is it affects the black market. So this year, Buffalo Trace has decided to remove those things uh, so you don't know how much is, of each one is produced. It's going to affect its secondary value, but not much. There's a general guideline of what bottles usually go for year by year. It's going to find its place. But I think it's a good move, so kudos to Buffalo Trace. This week, we sit down with Alex Cunningham, the co-founder, which very unique spelling. Jack promises to spell it correctly. He is the co-founder of Slain Irish Whiskey. Slain Irish Whiskey... For those who don't know, Slane Castle in Ireland is a massive music venue that has seen people like the Red Hot Chili Peppers, U2. He told a story off air about Axl Rose. And Eminem is a massive music venue in Ireland of a town, a village. He doesn't like town. What do you say, 1,500 people? 1,600 people? And his castle... His castle. I'm, I I grew up poor in a three bedroom house, and uh, his castle uh, does eighty thousand people, and that's what they capped it at. At one year, they had a bunch of they had over a hundred thousand people there for their concerts. So, in a town of sixteen hundred, quite the endeavor. So, Slane has an incredible history. Look it up. It's fantastic. And they've decided to get in the whiskey business. Now, we have talked on this show about Slain Irish Whiskey. And uh, we had Chris Morris here about a year. It seems like about a year ago, maybe six months ago, to talk Slain Irish Whiskey. And I, I'm a huge fan. My only criticism has always been that it's 80 proof and it needs a little bump. It doesn't need a little bump. It actually it tastes great. I We drank quite a bit of it on air today. Uh, but... I, I prefer a bump. I prefer like a 90 proof, 95 proof, something, somewhere in there. Uh, but I had a fantastic conversation with Caleb and Alex, who both work for the brand. Um, and it was just a, a good conversation about the history of the castle, the concerts they've had there, uh, the future of the brand and where it's going. And uh, yeah, it was just awesome. I, I, I liked it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So this week's show is sponsored by Tomatin Highland Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. Taste the softer side of the Highlands with award-winning Tomatin Single Malt Scotch. You can pick up the full line of Tomatin items at your local liquor store, or if you're a retailer, reach out to your Southern Glazers reps. Copyright 2019, Tomatin Scotch, 43 to 46% alcohol by volume, imported from Scotland by Phillips Stilling Company in Princeton, Minnesota. I got it! <laughs> I have always had trouble with that little, that little tag part. Uh, we've got a couple more sponsors to get through, but I also want to mention the Houston Whiskey Social. We have exactly less than, by the time you hear this, less than two weeks away, 10 days before the end of the month, in which early bird ticket sales for the event go off sale. So they will still be on sale, but they will not be at the discounted rate that they're currently at. So you can save yourself 25 bucks by going to HoustonWhiskeySocial.com. This will be... This will be uh, it is my goal every year to be better, but this will be the best year yet. We've got some pretty cool things happening. So Whiskey Neat is supported also by the Inspired Spirits at Glass Revolution Imports and Amroot Distilleries. Amroot crafts one of the most award-winning Indian single malts to the exacting standards of scotch. Amroot Fusion is a perfect example of what great Indian single malt can do, winning double gold at the Proof Awards. Amrit Fusion also received the double gold blind, blind is a very important part of that, and scored a jaw-dropping 96 points by judges at the Proof Awards. Amrit Single Malt Whiskey is widely available across America and can be found almost everywhere, but especially in Texas. Go out and get a bottle today. 
Our last sponsor is the official sponsor of Whiskey Neat, and that is Balconies. In 2008, Balconies was nothing more than an idea driven by a passion to create something original and authentic. Focusing on ingredients and process, they breathed new life into hundreds of years of distilling traditions, earning them worldwide recognition for their whiskeys. You can pick up their whiskeys at your local liquor store, or if you're a retailer, reach out to your Southern Glaciers representative. We have a, a surprising number of people who watch this show, which I have no idea. I have no idea why you're, you're, you're drinking too much probably. But what I want you to do, please do me a favor. I'm begging you to please two things. All of our shows merchandise for this show can be found at whiskeymerch.com. That's whiskey with the E whiskeymerch.com. You can get your whiskey peach shirts. You can get your mugs, you're this, you're that, the whole nine yards. We had a whole graphic team come up with the the logos and, and make them work for merchandise. Go get it, whiskeymerch.com. But more importantly than anything is review the show. Please, yes, there's a lot of viewers who know me personally. You guys know me as a personal favor to Chris Hart. Christopher, please go to iTunes and rate and review the show. Give me your feedback. Give it five stars. Give it a plug. It's appreciated. I love you guys. And without further ado, Alex Cunningham and Caleb Gutierrez of Slain Irish Whiskey. Cheers. Alex Cunningham. Hello. Very nice to meet you. And yourself. Very nice to meet you. Caleb? Yes, sir. We're fa- oh, let's do this here. We're Facebook friends. Absolutely. And uh, we, we met in person for the first time. Um, I'm I'm excited to have you both here today. We've we've had quite a few shows that had very little to do with the art and beauty of whiskey, and more to do with uh, comedy and and other people who just happen to be in town. Um, I'm excited to to revisit this. So we when you guys first kind of hit Texas, we had Chris Morris on, uh, and we we visited Slane, and I was very happy with it. So uh, he told a little bit about the backstory, but not a lot. So I'm I'm. I'm, I, I want to hear it all. Give it to me. Sure. Um, I guess I'll, I'll probably start with a name. That's sure. It's a good place to start because there's a lot in a name. So Slane's actually the place where I'm lucky enough to live. And it's about 45 minutes north of Dublin and very pretty part of Ireland that would have been a haven of distilling back in the 18th century called the Boyne Valley uh after the river boyne and that's actually our source of water at, at slain distillery so that was one of the reasons why historically distillery set up there and also we got some of the best farmland in the country and we are a farming family We've got about 1500 acres we grow about 2000 tons of barley a year uh, so those two reasons are why distilleries were there historically and those were the main drivers two of the main drivers we decided to get into whiskey in the first place was the the fact that you were already growing barley and what was the other one? Uh, that we had the water supply. And gotcha. then I guess the last one was, uh, so the family home where, where I grew up is called Slane Castle. And uh, it's a big, beautiful 18th century building, <coughs> freezing cold in winter. Um, the American in me really wants to hate you. <laughs> grew up yeah, in a castle. I grew up in a I castle. I grew up in Pasadena, yeah. Texas. <laughs> the sky has never been blue. Yeah. Let's just say that. <laughs> uh, it's not blue too often in Ireland yeah. um, either. But uh, no, so um, we had to kind of figure out how to keep the castle going, or my dad did. And uh, what actually put Slane on the map in the first place wasn't whiskey at all. It was a big outdoor rock concerts in the in the early 80s. Um, so during the Troubles, when things were a bit tricky in Ireland um, and things were financially difficult, Dad, who loves his rock and roll, decided he was going to turn the front garden into an outdoor music venue, uh, persuaded a band called uh, Thin Lizzy to put on the first show. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, one of their great tracks is Whiskey in the Jar. Yep. And he says that that was kind of part of the inspiration for getting into the music, uh, getting into the whiskey business later. So... Uh, first show was Thin Lizzy and, and U2, who then lived with us and recorded The Unforgettable Fire in the dining room. Um, so that was good fun. And right. then, Jesus. Yeah, so had a, <laughs> had a colorful upbringing, but um, and we've had The Stones and Dylan and many other artists, Springsteen. Our last show was just Metallica um, uh, back in June this year. And uh, <laughs> the whiskey business, uh, we got bounced into that because whiskey and rock and roll were obviously go very well together 
But mainly we just wanted another family business and we were already growing the barley for cattle feed. And we said, why the hell are we giving it to, to cattle when we could uh, add the value at home? And you can still it give it to them food. after the fact, right? Yeah, a, you a, can. A, that's a big, true. That big, still happens. Absolutely. That's a huge uh, part of distillation is giving yeah, away that grain. grain. Yeah, so that goes to a couple of local dairy farms. Um, and actually, you know, um, our other... Sustainability is kind of really important in terms of how we've designed the distillery. So spent grain is one kind of closed loop. Uh, the other one is we're getting close to commissioning. We have an anaerobic digester at the distillery. So we take the pot ale and spent leaves, which is obviously what's left in the still after you've extracted all the alcohol. And we're going to be feeding that to an anaerobic digester. The microbes feed on, on the sugars that yeast and get to. And that will create biogas, which we can then use to directly... Uh, heat the stills and when that's up and running about 25 30 percent of our thermal energy will be created on site so that's leaving a lighter footprint which is one of the important really important things. Yeah, yeah it's one of the things we need to try and do at Slane as well that's a pretty big focus for you though sustainability huh yeah it is well i guess dad always taught me that you know um i'll never be lucky enough to own Slane. i'm just there to protect it for the next generation and we try and go a bit beyond that and actually enhance it leave it better than when we arrived and, and the whiskey is kind of a means of doing that because we're creating locals uh, but we get to use the cereals that we're growing right around the distillery uh, which means we have to move them less distances uh, and then ultimately um, create create some wonderful juice in the process sure sure and this is <clears throat> if i remember correctly this is the only expression currently right the the triple dist or the triple cask method correct uh, what's what's coming down the pipeline in terms of do you have guys have plans for anything yeah finishes or i know there's a little bit of finish involved in this one the triple different casks i think what was it, one of them was sherry yeah so um uh so talking about like what we're going to do in the future firstly um slain distillery is a little unusual in that if you go to scotland generally you'll have a malt distillery or you'll have a grain distillery um and we actually do both. So we actually make three different types of whiskey at the one distillery. So we have three pot stills because uh, we believe in triple distillation for our, for our malt whiskey, triple distilled malt. But we also make triple distilled pot still, which introduces the unmalted barley into the mash bill. Um, that's going to take a few years to mature the unmalted barley. It needs a bit longer in the wood. Um, then we have, um, out of those three pot stills, we can also make triple distilled malt whiskey or single malt whiskey, which we can blend in, in, into, sure. this, into this product, Slain. And then finally, we have six column stills. Now, the Jesus. reason we have six is because of the height restrictions. The whole um, distillery is an architectural conservation area. Uh, so so that means we can't build too high sure, because you can't have column stills being bigger than the castle. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to split the analyzer and the rectifier into three each. That gives us a total of six columns. Uh, plus, we are using an all barley mash bill run through the columns, which is pretty unusual as well. So that's going to give us some really interesting single grain whiskey. So we got single pot still, single malt, and single grain, which allows us to also create blends as well. So sure. We got a pretty diverse palette out of the one distillery. So that's the future. Um, but this is our first release, which is a blend. Uh, we started production only in 2017. So the, the build of the distillery, because of these buildings were all protected, involved a really extensive restoration. And our, um, our whiskey making style is very traditional. So we use traditional copper pot stills. Uh, we don't use stainless steel fermenters. We use timber washbacks because I always believe that making whiskey is is working with rather than against nature. And I just believe the timber gives a gives a better flavor profile. And then obviously we're growing our own some of our own barley as well. Um, really grain the grain the glass. Yeah, that's the whole that's the whole approach and and leaving the lighter footprint in the process. So. We started production only in the latter half of 2017. So obviously, you know, your whiskey rules, that means that the whiskey we have in front of us couldn't actually be made at Slane Distillery. So in order to get ourselves started, we actually bought malt whiskey and grain whiskey from other distilleries in Ireland. Uh, and that was, had all been matured in American whiskey barrels, which is how a lot of Irish is matured because over here, uh, you can only use your barrels once, and we in Ireland and Scotland are very grateful. We sure. say thanks a million. We'll have those discount barrels. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So, 
American whiskey therefore has a big impact on on the Irish and Scotch categories. So we had this great juice, um, which was kind of between three and, and 10 years old. Some of the malt we bought had a good amount of age on it. We could have just put that together and created a blend, but actually in order to create our own flavor profile and the ambition for Slane was to try and create like all blends I would see as, as fairly smooth and approachable. We wanted to do that, but to live a body and flavor as well. So we actually did a secondary maturation uh, involving three barrels, and that's why we call this a triple cast blend. Wow, just the, the backstory. The In America, we have a, a problem in terms of um, – <clears throat> made up backstories like we yeah. we're, we're big on our on our bourbon backstories that that are you know my great grandfather's recipe mm-hmm. from 1776 and it, none of it's verifiable or or you know but you could you can go to ireland and you can are you guys doing tours yet have yeah you absolutely opened it up? yeah the distillery um so we actually opened the distillery uh just before we started production so we were letting people in before we got uh, production fully up and running because we wanted people to see that startup process. And technically, on the grain side, that's the last of the three types that we still need to nail. So we've done some trial batches, but in terms of getting full production, we've, we're have we making our new make triple distilled uh, malt is fantastic. Uh, the pot still is, is really outstanding, incredibly fruity, lots of body there already. That's going to turn into some great whiskey. And then uh, the grain one, the old barley mash bill, that's that's a really interesting one. So latter half of this year, we'll, we'll be doing the first full production run of that. Sure. So it, three years in a day, right? So uh-huh. when yep. we're talking... Got to get the extra day. In, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when, when, at what point in 2020 will we be seeing... And will it be a separate, I say skew, a separate expression altogether? Or will, will you be integrating yours into what's currently out so uh good question so the answer is both um so malt and grain obviously mature at different rates and behave differently with different woods so it's not going to be that one day we substitute what we made ourselves with what we bought from others it's actually going to happen gradually over time sure and then at the same time we're laying down stuff that will be standalone products that are made entirely at slain so in time you know we're definitely going to have a single pot still I think because our grain whiskey is a little unusual, um, being an all barley mash bill, uh, we could potentially look at a single grain product as well. Uh, that might mature a bit quicker than the pot still, so it, it, that might end up being released early. Um, and the slain blend that we have today will gradually start to incorporate some of the distillate that, that was made at slain. But the, the, the maturation process you know, in order to get consistency, which is really important, that will that will continue. So the triple cast process, that's the kind of signature that, that we want to include. Sure. And I, this has got to be annoying, and I hope it's not rude, but where's your accent from? <laughs> so my mom is from Cornwall okay. uh, in the UK, and my dad uh, is b- born and bred in Slane. So, so he's raised uh, there his whole life, and I've spent my life Mainly, I guess, in Ireland, quite a lot of time in the UK. My first job in Irish whiskey was actually working on on Jemison, the category leader, um, back in 99. Superstar leader. Yeah, yeah, that was nice. So that was in Australia. And I'm a bit like a chameleon. I tend to uh, pick up accents where I go. I haven't got a Texas drawl yet, but give me a couple of days. (laughs) No, yeah, no. Well, the, the... I don't hear Irish. I think yeah. I think English. Yeah, uh, and of so course I, I can't think of lately. I don't know if you ever watched uh, Outlander, but all I can all I want to hear when you talk, I hear the word Sassanac come to mind. Yeah, and- okay. Well, my dad, like who I founded the brand with, uh, and it was his idea. He'd have a pretty similar accent to me. So that you know, Ireland is is a land of many uh, many tribes and colors. Sure. I guess. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I I and I know every American says they're Irish, but I am very. Very much Irish. <laughs> I'm a huge, uh, huge fan. We went there, uh, I think, three, four years ago. We we made it our intention that if you're going to go to Ireland, and I've said this a bunch, you've got to – there's there's uh, churches. you got to go visit some of the beautiful churches. Yeah, the architecture. But you got to hit the pubs and the and the, and the Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's the center of Castles, life, right? Of you got to hit ruins. you yeah. got to hit the ruins. But- well, if you come to Slane, you can get – 
you can get two, right? You, you, you take, knock two off you the can take the castle box <laughs> and the distillery box. So. How long has the castle been there? Uh, so uh, my family bought the land in 1703. Uh, the castle was remodeled in the 1780s, and the buildings that the distillery are in date from around 1750s. So um, and that's what, crazy, man. Yeah. So I don't even know who my dad you. is. <laughs> <laughs> I just to see that like my family has been in one spot yeah. for 200 years, yeah. and I'm pretty sure I've narrowed down who could possibly be my dad. It's like the funniest thing to me. Yeah, um, it's it's a gorgeous, beautiful land, and and just a 17 what year? 1703. We've been Jeez, on the property. That's almost that's 300 yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. That's but there's a great distilling uh, heritage in, in Ireland, and Slane Distillery is one of a number. You know, I think we're up to close to 20 distilleries now. So, you know, you can go spend a few good days in Ireland. Ireland. Yeah. 20? T- take them in. Most of them are open, take tours. So uh, the Slain Distillery Tour is designed very much to uh, see the process. I wanted it to be a sensory-based experience. So, for example, we don't malt on site, but sure. we have a little micro-malting where we explain how you get from barley that comes off the field to the malt, which is just mimicking what happens in, in a malting plant and you can kind of taste that and then uh, you get to the wash backs you can smell you can taste the wash you know we wanted it to be a very interactive experience sure so <clears throat> is do you guys is all of the barley coming from you guys not not at the moment we're working towards that i have we have enough land to be able to do it but the thing is that growing feed barley which is what we were doing prior to getting into the whiskey is very different to growing malting barley sure um, so the aim is to get to that, but we're not there yet. Two row or? Uh, we grow, typically we'll grow two varieties every year. The reason for that is that you want to hedge your bets. So if one is particular vulnerable to disease or to lodging where it gets hit with heavy rain and falls over, if you have your other row, uh, your other variety, then, then you mitigate against that risk. So a good example would be we had some seriously heavy rain this year. If you've got a four row variety, and that gets hit at the wrong time, it's going to flatten. And that, that really affects uh, quality and, and yield. Sure, and yield. Yeah. So we, uh, we look at quality and yield. We grow generally modern hybrid varieties at the moment, but I am also interested in looking uh, at some of these older heritage varieties, not only because of their impact on flavor, but actually they have interesting impacts for biodiversity. Because longer straw, uh, which is what a lot of the older varieties have, actually supports things like field mice and other things that, that wouldn't necessarily be able to thrive in the shorter varieties sure. that we grow today. So we assess our impact on biodiversity, not just quality and yield. And I think that's I think that's the right way to be looking. So we grow wild bird covers around at the edge of the barley fields to try and in, improve biodiversity and reduce uh, the number of artificial inputs that we put into the ground. So organic matter is declining globally. um, And we in the whiskey business need to be conscious that we are linked directly to the land. So again, it's about trying to have that lighter uh, lighter Lighter impact. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Well, and just being self-sufficient in almost every way is is such a a good step up. You know, like I know you said you've only been in the business for a couple of years, but uh, the lighter impact, growing your own barley, like just just that self sufficient system or, or working towards that is a is a huge step up, and it's like you know it, it can't be easy um, starting from nothing, right? It can't be cheap either. <laughs> no, it's not. It, it, it's not cheap. I mean, it's getting into the whiskey business is not not for the faint hearted. You know, you need patience, um, and obviously you got to wait for the stuff to mature. Thick skin as yeah. well, too. Um, Have you guys heard any bad? I haven't heard any bad feedback about you guys yet. Uh, well, that's good to hear. Yeah, yeah. Mm. You, you're traveling the world yeah. speaking about a, a genuinely delicious Irish whiskey. I'm very happy yeah. with this. So one of my favorite things is actually going to other distilleries. And I find, you know, I believe in sharing information because that's how generally things get better. And in order to maintain a high standard <laughs> within Irish whiskey, we need to work together as an industry. A hundred percent. And uh, the Irish Whiskey Association uh, does great work in helping to do that. And you know, I didn't know a whole lot about whiskey production when I got into this business. And the way I learned, um, I'm not the master distiller. We have a new head distiller, uh, uh, Garo Cahill, who just joined us recently. Um, but, That's an Irish name. Oh, yeah, heard it, it is. It is. Uh, he's, he's a lovely man. He's already doing great work. But um, And then Alan Buckley before uh, helped, helped design things. But 
I got a huge amount of help from other people in the industry because I always found there was an open door when I asked a question. And I believe in doing the same myself, you know, because that's ultimately how we collectively get better. And uh, we want to make the best possible whiskeys. And that means, um, you know, I'm very happy to, to help others along the way. Sure. Well. But yeah, I love visiting other other distilleries. That's you, And you, got, you need to keep doing it because that's how you learn. Well, 100%. And that's something that Texas has struggled with in particular. I, I think it, it's always interesting to me, <clears throat> generally speaking, and, and I'm going to say this and then let me shape it. All right. Okay. So generally speaking, I think it's not hard to make good Irish whiskey. And what I mean is <laughs> Texas has struggled to find their profile to, to do we go smaller barrels? Mm. Do we go larger barrels? And it, and it, and it, I have not had many, I have had some bad Irish whiskey, mm -hmm. but it, it seems like it, it might be the more tempered client, you know, or climate. Uh, sorry, my mouth yeah. is numb. Uh, the, you guys have a pretty, fantastic climate versus the hot days and we do and we and very we, short winters here yeah, yeah. yeah but we got it firstly we got a our great, winners a tuesday by the yeah. way it's, okay. <laughs> it's, it's like one day yeah and i mean splitting. i think you know water quality and the right uh breeding ground for growing the raw material is really important um but what's interesting within irish is um how each distillery is carving out its own identity. So if you look at Scotland, you've got very clear regional diversification. Five, six, five. Campbelltown, yep. Highlands, Speyside, Lowlands. Mm -hmm. Isla. 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 Yeah. yeah. So that doesn't exist in Ireland. So what's interesting is, is how each of us are going to carve out our own thing. So for me, for Slain, you know, innovation, particularly on the maturation side, is going to be important. Wood's a big part of what we do. But obviously our link to the land and our own raw materials gives us you know, I'm not aware of any other distillery that has access to the 1,500 acres and, and being able to grow their own raw material um, and then developing a style. So, you know, when we came up with a slain blend, Irish blends for me are generally smooth. You mentioned sweetness earlier, which I think is a nice kind of common ground and pretty approachable. So we wanted to tick those boxes, but then on top of that, deliver flavor forward. So quite big and bold. And that's why we invested in the secondary maturation. Now, it took us two more years to do that, but I think it was worth it for, for what we delivered in terms of flavor. So you won't see anything come out of Slain that is light and fluffy. We're about big, bold, flavorful sure. whiskeys. And, and the, wood, the wood is an important part of that. Oh, uh, 100%. I mean, you get most of your flavor from the wood. I think the, the, the sweetness, uh, I keep saying sweetness as if I have a short vocabulary, but the... I think the typical profile for Irish whiskeys would be more of a lighter honey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Light, light, clear honey is so I, I kind of see it as going um, light, clear honey all the way to like almost dark brown sugar treacle territory. You do get there. Um, yeah. And uh, the second barrel that we use in Slain, so you've got the Virgin American Oak being the first. The second one um, we call season, which is, which is a generic term that just means that there's been liquid in there before. But what's interesting is that. All Irish distilleries and Scotch distilleries buy barrels from America because they're available. Um, but the thing is that there's not really any track and trace. So even if you're buying direct from a distillery, those distilleries will be make lots of different liquids. So you don't know exactly what liquid has been in what barrel. So we deal with it by blending. However, because of our relationship with Brand Foreman, we were able to turn around and say, well, what if we focus primarily on one particular barrel, which in this case is actually a Tennessee whiskey or, or a Jack barrel, mm -hmm. so that we can then zero in on the flavor impacts of that They've particular They've got a type. ton of their banana notes are very, exactly, very yeah. uh, complementary of, of a yeah. honeyed profile. Yeah, but also this heavier brown sugar note, so veering away sure, from sure. the lighter side, a lot of that's actually coming from that second barrel. So do all of your barrels come from Jack Daniels? All of the seasoned ones. Okay. Not all, I would say primarily. You know, sure. I mean, um, but then the Virgin comes from the Virgin Oak the is Cooperage, yeah. from the Cooperage in in uh, in Kentucky and Louisville. Um, I'm still turning how to, how to say Louisville correctly. I'm still working <laughs> yeah. on it. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, but um, so yeah, that's the first barrel, primarily Jack for the second barrel, and then you mentioned the Sherry, which is my own personal, you know, love. So, oh, I love Sherry. Ah, uh, I mean, not all Irish have Sherry, 
uh, influence, but uh, but a lot of the good stuff does. And I white, think they're perfect for each other. Yeah, uh, they're exactly, like yeah. black and like black yin and yang. I think more sherry influence should be involved in Irish whiskey, and it's not. Yeah, uh, I love Jameson as well, but it does stick to that typical honeyed light profile, right? Because it it's tried and true, and they sell a crap ton of it, right? Yeah, uh, but the sherry influence is like yeah. really nice. So it's probably the biggest out of the three barrels, like in terms of body and depth. Um, but it delivers this lovely dried fruit note, like a little bit of kind of raisin sultana. Mm-hmm. And then on the finish, you know, hopefully you're not finding any bite, but there is a little bit of a kind of brown or baking spice finish right on right on the finish. And I don't get much bite. Yeah. So, I, but I, it, I it's think like you a kind little of... bit of spice, like almost, uh, yeah, as I say, delicate brown, brown spice. And that's right on the finish. And that that's the influence of the sherry, a little bit from the virgin oak as well. Um, but you've essentially got three very different whiskeys, which we then blend into one, and that's that's what makes Slane sure. taste the way it does. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's very a very approachable, uh, easy introduction to the Irish category, and a much better choice versus some kind of. I think a lot of categories get kind of. Um, I mean, you remember being twenty one and in college, and you have like one bad experience with. Like a oh. tequila, and you said, I'll never go back I'll to never that drink tequila. It again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a great introduction, I think, to a, uh, oh, look, Jared Hempstead's calling me <laughs> uh, from Balconies. Um, yeah. So it, it's, it's a, I think it's a great foot in the door for like a really fantastic category that has a ridiculous amount of history. So, uh, and I, I started asking this before because I kind of jumped the gun, but you mentioned a few crazy names that have played yeah. at Slane Castle. Uh, Tell me more. Like, what's what's the uh, first of all? I, I don't know how old you are, but you look like you're probably much younger than you are. <laughs> like you've you've got a like you've lived a much better life than I have. <laughs> like just, well, I don't, just I like, don't know about that. It's just, uh, just been a, a like wild. Most of my bubble is Houston, right? Yeah, I, I do okay. get to branch out from time to time, but uh, the first time I ever left Houston. Uh, and traveled the world was when I was 20 and went to San Antonio. Okay. So right. it's, it's, All right. it's, that might as well be the backyard, yeah. right? So, uh, you've had some incredible names. H- how did you even find talent that would play there? Like, what's the. So, in, in the early days, you know, dad drove that along with, with two, uh, two promoter friends of his. And, you know, they had back in the 81 when he persuaded Thin Lizzy to headline. And uh, you two were one of the support acts. You know, they they had no money. You two were the support acts. Yeah, yeah I know. Exactly. And now I look at them, but uh, greatest band in the in in the world. But they, um, when they dad put on the first gig, there was there was no money, so um, it was actually underridden by um, effectively a gangster from the East End of London, who was known as Mister Everything. Because yeah. everything's gonna be all right, Henry. Henry's my dad's name. Love it. Uh, so he put up the money. That and nobody is horribly asked scary. Yeah. 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 That's whole, that, that reminds me of Bricktop. You yeah. remember Bricktop from uh, Guy Ritchie's? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what um, was it? Uh, Lockstock. Snatch. No, Snatch. Snatch. Yeah, yeah, Snatch. Uh, Bricktop was yeah. uh, the most scary film character yeah. uh, and one of the greatest films of all time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Everything sounds even horror, yeah. even worse. Yeah. Does he have any pigs? <laughs> <laughs> oh God. I don't know if, I don't know if the, if the guy's even still alive, but anyway, he, he helped get that first show off the ground. And then um, I guess taking it to the next, to the next level, dad realized if slain first, we had about 18,000 people to that first gig. I was six years old. So yeah. I don't remember a whole lot about, about that gig, but um I remember the the following year, he um, he wanted to get a big international artist, and he he had met Mick Jagger previously, um, and managed to persuade the Stones to come in '82, and and that was the largest outdoor rock concert ever held in Ireland. Oh, until really? That time, uh, well over. They don't know the exact numbers because in those days, quite a few people could break in. Security sure, was yeah, a little yeah. less lax. Right. Um, and twenty uh, plus thousand. Oh no! Like it was well over eighty thousand. Oh really? Yeah. Wow. Um, and Dad uh, got got letters from the church and everything, and being accused of corrupting the youth of Ireland. And of oh, course, he sure. loves that shit. So yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what a friend of <laughs> Yeah. So so that put the place on the map. And yeah, we've we've had some amazing artists over the years, and I've been lucky enough to to see some extraordinary performances. 
Um, do you play yourself? I would imagine that it might inspire a little artistic side of you. Uh, I used to play, first I played, uh, and not very well. I, I used to play the bass guitar a little bit. Um, Same. And I, I remember turning down lessons from Adam Clayton from U2, which is probably one of the sillier things I've done. He yeah. offered and you said no? <laughs> yeah, I was I was a young teenager sure, interested you, in other things. You were, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and other people. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. exactly. I, uh, I, wow, Jesus. Uh, if I, I, I like most people in America, YouTube videos of like simple bass riffs. Of, you yeah, know, that was like my start was a, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, an old uh, diamond series Schecter that I ended up selling because for a bachelor party, like yeah. it was so, such a, uh, I think most people, I would say, I'm, have you ever played an instrument? Yeah, I, I play guitar and computer. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I think I it's the computer. I play the radio really well. Sure. <laughs> um, no, guitar, piano. Um, I dabble in yeah. bass just because guitar and bass tend to kind of go, go kind of hand in hand. Yeah. Um, a little less complicated. Yeah. yeah. That kind of also you know? turned me off a little bit when I found out that bass is like the junior version of the guitar basically well, you got one more uh, string yeah, you know I mean, yeah a good bass player like take phil Lynott from thin lizzie i mean oh man know, it, oh it, it, it can be an extraordinary instrument if, right. if done in the right way victor wooten is one of the greatest bass players of all time and a lot of people don't know who he is but he'll play songs where he's the only instrument and it yeah. sounds like there's at least two or three other yeah. instruments involved i mean yeah. look at flea yeah from the jelly peppers oh, man that guy he's kill it yeah, yeah. yeah. I He's made ugly pull, look cool. Yeah. <laughs> he pulled a somersault off on the on the stage when he played at Slane, and yeah, that was that was an amazing gig. They supported U two in two thousand and one when they came back and headlined. Did a DVD actually live at live at Slane, which is a that's what you were talking about. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Oh four, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think then, and uh, that was a hell of a show. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's if you want to see what a Slane concert is all about, I'd recommend uh, looking you, that up. So are you guys still? doing that so oh, yeah. live venue like, so oh. I, I would imagine the whiskey's a big part of that yeah very much so so it's uh, got to be perfect for a concert it uh, is yeah. so actually this year uh <laughs> back was the uh, back in june we had we had metallica play and that was the first time we'd served slain whiskey to to the main audience the sure. thousand people so we we smashed out oh, tens yeah. of thousands of cocktails high pace and yeah that crowd can drink <laughs> yeah that's the that's the only thing that like i always panic uh and i have a whiskey festival here i always I, there's a lot of stress involved with consumption yeah you go to any concert ever though and you realize ah it's a it, i mean it's on them <laughs> like, yeah exactly. there's there's a, a tremendous amount of uh uh i can't imagine doing 30 40 000 people um, and probably clearing out all of your stocks yeah slain. it was a hell of a buzz incredibly well behaved crowd though sure uh, so it went down really well so every slang concert from now on like the whiskey is always going to be there. Right. It's like, it's be you know, slain, yeah. Dad and myself always felt, you know, the whiskey and the music were a good natural match. And you can anyway. sell it there, can't you? You can't, you can sell bottles you can oh, yeah, or yeah. buy the bottle, right? Uh, you can't buy the bottle at the concert. <laughs> <laughs> right. But so how does that work? If I, if I go to the distillery, oh, I can, yeah, you I can, can buy, buy a some oh, bottles. Yeah, yeah. But we at a, a concert, you obviously wouldn't want. Yeah. You just buy the cocktails. You right. Know. You right. wouldn't, you wouldn't want to sell it by the bottle at a concert. No, definitely yeah. not. And Although you know, you responsible could. consumption is, sure. is really important as well. So the most important. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's funny earlier, he mentioned, um, he mentioned like his dad in, in the front garden, right? It's not what we would expect when we're talking about a garden, you know, kind of deal. Yeah, no, it's a We're field. talking about a giant <laughs> field, lawn field, yeah. right? That will hold 80K, 80,000 yeah. people out there, you know? Yeah. And the River Boyne is the, is the backdrop. Yeah. And that's our water source for the distillery. And dad had the very, very surreal um, moment of when Springsteen played um, at Slane. They yeah. recorded footage of the River Boyne. And then he went to watch uh, Bruce play in Wembley in the UK. And they played And the they footage. projected the f footage of the River Boyne. So suddenly the River Boyne was flowing in Wembley Stadium, which was which was pretty surreal. Yeah, it's got to be. Uh, uh, it's it's crazy that the time periods in which someone had a very simple idea, like, hey, you know, let's turn this into a music venue and then have some of the biggest acts of all time. Oh. Just kind of come through there. Yeah. 80, 85, 86, and 87. Fortunately, I was a young kid then. Wouldn't have ever I was it, born in 87. So 85 was Bruce Springsteen. 86 was uh, Queen. And 87 was, um, uh, 
my mind just went blank. David Bowie. Yeah. So back to back to back, right? Just and if I'm not mistaken, Queen had the highest attendance. Yeah, was Queen like, was the biggest crowd. It was like 117, yeah. 118,000 people. That was people. an amazing How show. much room do you have for this? So we're capped now at, I think the capacity is 82,000 is the maximum we can take in now. And, and kind of manage. Yeah. So things like it's not back to the Mr. Everything days. It's a little more professional. Sure, now. sure, <laughs> sure. So, uh, yeah, no, we have to health and safety that, but that's still a big crowd. I mean, remember Ireland's a small country, so to have an artist that can sell that many tickets. Oh, it's it, the whole um, country's there. <laughs> but we actually, we get people coming from all over the world to Slane now, not just to see the whiskey and the distillery, but for the gigs, uh, for Metallica, we had uh, about 20% of the crowd came from, from outside Ireland. Uh, they obviously have a big international following, but uh, the Wall Street Journal is a little while ago now put, put Slane up you know, along with Red Rocks and some of the other great outdoor venues as being being in the the top venues in the world. Artists love to play there. Do um, you, is it just rock? Cause no, I, I've we've, re- we've had Eminem. Uh, that was a hell of a show. We even did Madonna because dad really wanted a female uh, um, artist to headline. So yeah. that was probably the, the most poppy act we've done. But we have done a lot of rock. I mean, we've had Dylan. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been quite diverse. I think, you know, music has got, um, so much more eclectic now in terms of there's so many genres. Sure, that sure. we wouldn't want subgenres. Yeah, kind of we wouldn't want to box down. ourselves just just into the rock side of thing. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love a good a good rock show, but like the Eminem show was was awesome. We had Chance the Rapper on that bill as well. And remember, we're also talking headliners here. You know, yeah. like in between. Massive you know, headliners. Yeah, you know, they had like the Kaiser Chiefs and Royal Blood. You know, I mean, quite a few other bands that are out there and everybody's recognized the songs before. And, and they're the ones who were building up to, boom, the big guy. You sure, know? sure. So, I mean, a lot of people have Yeah, Slane has a long history of, you know, and it's fun watching, you know, an artist come lower down on the bill and then they come back a few years later on a headline. That's always nice to, sure. nice to see. Uh, to to watch them grow from kind of an opener to a like you just didn't you mention you two was the opening act of <laughs> yeah well not the opening act but they were one of the opening acts sure. for the very first gig they were just and getting it's you two yeah like yeah. one yeah. of the largest acts of all time yeah, yeah. And I think they may actually hold the record uh, but they they basically sell it everywhere they go they do I mean but those guys work you know really hard they're about to go out on on tour again and. You know, they have a, a long relationship with Slane. It'd be lovely to have them back there one day. Sure. So, um, but it, think, might, it might be too small. <laughs> well, they're so big. I mean, this is the thing. You could sell out back-to-back show. In the home market, you know, people will, will travel for that. So hopefully we can make it happen someday. Sure, sure. Well, wow, this is just fantastic. So we, we briefly mentioned – sorry, pause. Mm-hmm. We briefly mentioned what's coming down the pipeline. Um what can we get a peek into what you're like what y'all are planning or talking uh, any you know any crazy wine finishes besides sherry any kind of yeah, standalone I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see us um we're, we're still figuring out our maturation strategy for for the pot still and for the single grain um i think we definitely want to be experimental on the wood side uh so that will mean looking at some some more unusual casks Madeira, um, cognac. Yeah. I think American, because of our relationship with Brian Foreman, that, that's always going to be, um, as it were, that's always going to have a strong role to play. Sure. But we need to bring in uh, variation. And then in terms of process innovation, you know, we can, we can introduce different barley varieties. I think that's going to be an interesting. Uh, I have a small section of the farm that's, that's currently got full organic status. So that that's going to be interesting to to do some stuff out of that. Um, we cultivate. Uh, we just use standard yeast strains at the moment, but Brian Foreman is one of the only whiskey companies that cultivates its own yeast strains yeah. at, at both Jack and and Woodford. So that might be an interesting development for further down the track. Uh, and then on the wood side, you know, there's no end to to the variation that we can do there. And because we make three different types of whiskey at the one distillery. That opens a whole scope for for blending as well, you know, beyond our current blend. This is always going to stay. Slain, the triple cast blend, that's yeah, here that's to your, stay. That's your workhorse. Yeah, yeah that, exactly. Line, yeah. But, you know, where we bounce from in there in terms of additional casks and, you know, yeah. So there's never um, there's never a dull moment in terms of decision making. Sure. And uh, I think of it a bit like, you know, a painting. You know, you've got your, you've got your base layer. And then you got the ability to build up different things on top of that and create different landscapes. Uh, absolutely agree. I think uh, I think it'd be fun to see uh, 
Brown Foreman is is very well versed on single barrel programs, and oh, there, are, yeah. there are not many single barrel. I can't think of one. Yeah, single barrel Irish whiskey, but uh, plenty of Scotch producers do it. There are. I guess what's different is in the states. Um, Mainly the single barrel programs are based on selecting it when the maturation is finished. Um, yeah. Scotland, then you, you tend to, not always, but sometimes it's the other way around. So you actually, you pay for the barrel when it goes into the barrel and then you've got to wait like 10 years. Futures, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, we're still figuring out how we're going to do that, but there will definitely be a single barrel program coming out of Slain at some stage um, because it's a, it's a great chance for people to be able to really zero in on a particular barrel type and i think you know we need to give um we need to give people the opportunity to do that it's just a question of how we do it and when so i i a couple years back there is a fantastic distillery in scotland called edradour oh yeah i know well, and a yeah. uh, huge fan of theirs they have a single barrel program in which they would uh but it's more like ordering off a menu Mm -hmm. And so some of the big accounts like your specs or your total wine, they'll they'll see what's available at 2007, a 14-year this, a cash drink that, or sherry this, a sherry that. And they'll just say, okay, we'll take this one, this one, this one, this one, without ever tasting it. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a, a great process. Um, some of the best stuff to come from Signatory uh, over at Specs has been off the charts fantastic. Like for some reason – I love Glenroth's, but the single barrel, eighteen year old cast strength signatory releases are just off the. Ch like, it's almost always a winner every single yeah. time. <clears throat> that being said, there's this other side of the market that the bourbon producers have have kind of capitalized and kind of cornered the market on that I think would be so great, and that is getting samples in market. But it's mm -hmm. a. I know that it's a, a hassle for you guys. So right. what we tried to make happen with Edger Tower, which didn't happen at the time, but now they're entertaining it, is slipping some samples onto a pallet that's being shipped from a different order. So yeah. that way it's not a whole separate endeavor in the whole nine yards. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real tricky legal process. It's also very expensive. But um, – I've talked about this before. The Houston Bourbon Society, which is the local group here in Houston, it's, uh, it's a beautiful group, but a bit of a mm -hmm. dealing with a public of 6,500 people. It's not 80,000 people, but it can be a bit tricky at times. Yeah. But that group is responsible this year in 2019 of a retail uh, by the bottle of 1,200 cases and $600,000 yep. for a Facebook group, which is absolutely unheard of. It's never happened before. Yeah. Uh, but there are groups like this that are popping up all over the U.S. and they are buying things by the barrel, right? They're doing barrel pick after barrel selection. And they're, of course, listen, we love to sell things by the case, but it's even better to sell it by the dozens of cases, right? So I think that Slane would be the only producer I know of. Uh, and I know people who would make the trip to the mm. castle, come and... How many barrels do you guys have aging currently? Uh, couldn't tell you offhand, um, but we're, let, we're you know our inventory is quite complicated because we obviously bought stuff to get us started from others, so that was in cask already, and then we've been laying down since we started producing uh, in the latter part of 2017. So all I can say is it's a, it's a good quantity of barrels. Sure, um, but you know what you're saying, I think. Um, Rather like our approach to the distillery tour, I always believe in in giving people a sensory based experience. So that right there, if we yeah. were if we were going to sell barrels, single barrels, I would definitely want people to be able to have the chance to sample them before they buy them. Oh, a hundred percent. And coming there to see the history yeah. and the yeah, but you know, it's a, it's a hell a of a commitment there. <laughs> for someone from here to to travel to Ireland. Like we'd love to welcome them, but. Um, I think if we did develop a program, it would be very nice to be able to bring samples to the market as well. Um, the other thing that, you know, we're exploring um, for for interest groups is, you know, slain, the, the blend is quite a complex liquid. The, the three different barrels I, I mentioned are effectively three different whiskeys. So we're, we're looking at, um, is it possible to allow people to delve into those three different types so they can actually oh, uh, see a, a deconstruction? Yeah, yeah, kind of deconstruction. yeah, yeah. So um, that, that may be something I'd like to try the, the virgin. Yeah. The, the virgin Irish whiskey. Yeah, yeah, that was an interesting one because initially, 
you know, New Word is obviously pretty aggressive on whiskey. So it actually had quite a lot of bite initially, which made me nervous because I wasn't used to working with New Word. Sure. But after about six to nine months, it started turning the corner and, and the bite started being replaced by, by the vanillins coming in, delivering the vanilla notes. So, yeah, that one is interesting. So, you know, that that's something that we'd, we'd like to explore as well. So I, I'm always a fan of, you know, sharing more information, giving uh, as much possible exposure to tasting as possible. So if and when we do launch a single barrel program, um, I would not be a fan of letting people buy something without having a chance to taste it. First. Sure. It's the difference between you telling me about Slane Castle and yeah. then me seeing Slane yeah, Castle. Yeah, sure. Right. So I, Nothing can, beats coming. It's coming. correct. It's surreal. You can, you can tell me how great it is. You can tell me about the history. You can rub it in my face that you know who your dad is, <laughs> yeah, but but going to Ireland yeah. and seeing the castle in person yeah. is such an it's the exact same thing with whiskey. Whiskey is such a beautiful spirit. It's so fantastic to share with friends, mm. and we're now permanently friends. You can yeah. can't take it back. Uh, <laughs> we're to to try whiskey and to just kind of experience it and being in a a, a rick house that's like forty degrees. And everything smells of old wood and, and stone, mm. you know, stone that's been there forever. Yeah. So, like, the steps aren't even even because yeah. they've been worn away from, well. from stuff. The experience is so off the charts romantic that you can't, you can't walk away from that and not be a permanent whiskey fanatic. I keep trying to convince Jack, our producer, to drink. He won't drink. He doesn't okay. drink. No, he just doesn't like alcohol. Yeah. But I it's know fair. that it's such a beautiful experience, especially yeah. going on some of these trips to distilleries, that it's it'll sweep you off your feet. Yeah. You know? So we get plenty of visitors to to Slain Distillery, you know, who may come with a partner or whatever. They may not be whiskey drinkers, sure. but the important thing is to make sure that they still have a good sensory based experience. Because even if you don't drink. You know, you can still pick up the aromas that you mentioned. And then at, at Slane, you've got the architectural input. And um, there's a certain artistry, I think, to how the distillery is put together. And those three stills, which, which I was involved in, in helping to design, um, uh, I haven't done it for years, but I used to sculpt a bit. And I see those things as works of art, you know. So you're, you know, you're enriching so many different sensory experiences, including, for example, tasting the malt itself. Sure. The, the grain. Sure. So you can come to Slane <laughs> Distillery and not be a drinker and still have a really good experience. And that that's very important to me because um, it's not all about the whiskey. Well, and Brown Foreman's been really great about being progressive in the sense that, like, when they tested the waters of their barrel-proof program, uh, they only released 60 barrels. Jack Daniels is the number one selling whiskey in the world. They sell more whiskey in the world. Any bar you go into, even the worst bars in the world, will always have at least Maker's Mark and Jack Daniels. And it's old number seven. And it's old number seven. So, yeah. And uh, they were uh, uh, careful. Like, let's test the waters. We're open to it. We'll try it. 60 barrels. And, of course, they all 60, all 60 of them got nabbed up immediately. Yeah. In a heartbeat. <clears throat> and now they're testing the waters with their rye. They're testing it at the 94 proof, 92 proof. I forget. It's fantastic. Uh, again, X amount of barrels. Mm -hmm. Just just testing the waters. Right. I openly welcome Brown Foreman to test the waters with a beautiful Irish whiskey with a great backstory. And I am more than happy to fly me and my wife to the <laughs> distillery to pick it out. <laughs> Uh, especially a deconstructed version of this. Yeah, Jameson tested the waters with like a, the Cooper's Crows, mm -hmm. where it was like yeah, a yeah. breakdown of yeah. different. I I would love to taste the Virgin, the Season, and the Sherry separate. Yeah, and well, maybe we are even we are doing market. that for for select uh, groups now at the distillery. We are doing that at the distillery already. A uh, tasting a, de a and deconstruction. As we're friends now, we can yeah. certainly do that yeah, for yeah. you. I'll um, uh, Facebook you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, it's something that we're yeah potentially um, looking at, at at opening to a slightly wider audience beyond the distillery. But but there's still a bit of technical stuff to sort out because as you can imagine, you got to get consistency in that as well. Right. Sure. And um, because the blending process is pretty complex, um, we need to be able to sure that we that we can deliver quality and consistency. But it's a really um, informative exercise to, to go through because through tasting and nosing those you realize how different these whiskies are and the impact of each particular wood 
um, has its own individual character. Sure. There's this beautiful <clears throat> distillery and a, a crazy person named Joe Heron who opened a brandy distillery in the heart of uh, Louisville. Yeah, I know. L- it's great. It's yeah. a great distillery. It's a there. fantastic distillery, and their entire dogma is experimentation. Yeah. They've got everything. Oh, yeah. Down they, in that warehouse, you've got all kinds of funky cars <laughs> going on. Now, I really admire, you know, Copper and King's done some great stuff. So. They, they've got uh, a little bit of everything, and you get to – not only when we go, we've, we've had the option – it, so often when being a a whiskey nerd when when you jump feet first feet first into this um uh hobby you want to try everything you want to experiment with everything you want to play with everything that's the only distillery i know of that will let you pick the proof that you're just like whatever you want you want cast strength 123 124 uh you can pick a little bit of this, pick a little bit of that. Like we, we went in, we bought, I think we bought two barrels. We're like, okay, we'll take, we'll stick a hundred cases of this barrel or, or not a hundred cases, but uh, yeah. we'll take a hundred bottles of this barrel. It's this playland that I really want to see branched out to. I really, as successful as it's been, I want to see more brands kind of adopt that. I know it's a lot of hoops to jump through just to the, the menial menial is probably not the right word, but just the task of trying to accommodate but the right people could come in and clear through, you know, 500 cases of something uh, and then have fun with it. Like yeah. Irish whiskey is at such, I think, such a beautiful moment in uh, now uh, with all the stuff that's coming out of Ireland right now. And I think there's something like five more distillers opening, ten more distillers. So if, um, if you take into account the ones that have permission but haven't yet been built um, – there's pretty much close to 40 distilleries now whether all of those actually get to happen but it's clear that there's you know there's an explosion there's, well it's an expo- there's that's an like explosion that's like a 50% growth yeah totally now whiskey generally because people are moving out of uh, unnamed tasteless white spirits and into things that have flavor and you whiskey s- delivers you, flavor it must have been the accent but i i, I I think you meant to say garbage vodka, but you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm getting. Yeah, at. Yeah. So, I know, I know. so um, people want flavor, right? And, wh- and whiskey offers that, but we're seeing growth in, in other categories like rum and, and all the rest. So um, flavor is driving decisions. And because people are looking for more flavor, I think Irish is just getting started oh, agreed. in terms of the innovation that's coming in and people are finding their feet and identifying their style. So over the next 20 years, Irish whiskey is going to become a really colorful, rich, diverse, but at the same time, uniform category because, you know, you still got to, like the Irish Whiskey Association is very, very strong in maintaining standards. That's really important. Sure. Um, and one Rules of, what, are important. Yeah, they are. Yeah. You've got to, you've got to, <laughs> you know, okay. My, my attitude to rules is, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> you know I, I've probably broken a few of my time. But when it comes to making the whiskey, you know, you, you've got to respect the traditions that are there. But you can't, you can't stifle innovation either. Agreed. So it's a balance between the two. Yeah. So that's, that's the entire point is Irish whiskey, I think, is primed to be explosive. But it's going to take people who push the boundaries and find – uh, find those things that work. Uh, that's the uh, that's what I think the difference is between most Armagnac and Lin Cantata. Lin Cantata mm-hmm. is a, a, an Armagnac producer that sources from several domains, and they they put out consistently cast strength, cast strength, whatever that cast strength might be. Uh, we we just recently got some samples in of of ten different barrels, ranging between fifteen year and. Um, I don't know, 21, 22, somewhere in there, that nice little sweet spot. Too old, and it's just a, it's a nice experience, but it's not, it doesn't taste good. Uh, but you're talking cash strength, unadulterated uh, Armagnac in a category that is almost always cut down to the minimum and just kind of... It's overlooked quite a bit. It's overlooked quite a bit, and that's unfortunate because it's so good. Sherry, too. Sherry, someone told me recently that Sherry exists solely because of the whiskey industry. There's a, there's a little bit of truth in that, in that the demand for sherry barrels uh, with the boom that's happening in whiskey sure. is is very strong, and sherry is a relatively small category. Um, however, sherry in its own right, thankfully, uh, because of the, the global interest and in flavor, is also growing. Um, Hereth is an amazing place to visit. Some of the best food you'll, you'll ever encounter. Fantastic hospitality as well. Um, but um, sherry deserves to, to, to grow. Agreed. And also the foundation of 
some of the best old school cocktails as well. Uh, Nothing sh- beats Sherry Cobbler. You can't beat it. Sherry yep. is off the ch- – there's a little bit of controversy over a Texas producer who kind of got in before that trade agreement kicked in, Chansa, who makes a Texas Sherry. But it is the – blind, you would not be able to, I think, discern it from classic – I mean, it's just fantastic – Okay, Sherry nice. style, right? right? Well, thank you so much for coming on. It Thanks was an absolute pleasure meeting you. Really enjoyed it. Uh, Thanks, Caleb. Lot. Very nice you, meeting you. Yes, sir. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see you in Slane, I hope. I, I will be. We have a trip planned for France in April, and okay. I wouldn't mind hopping around. It's like super cheap to hop around between countries yes. over there. So uh, it's like traveling from Texas to Oklahoma. So yeah. Um, I'll come see us. Thanks so much for coming. All right. Cheers. Cheers. This week's show is, as always, sponsored by Trilado Distel Artisan Spirits, leader in premium artisan products like Bunohaben, Deanston, Lecheg, Tobermory, Baines, Black Bottle, and, of course, Scottish Leader. You can pick up the entire line at your local liquor store, or if you are a retailer, reach out to your United Wine and Spirits rep.